Hi out there, this is Heather Vickery and you've tuned in to the Brave Files podcast. Today, we're talking all about resilience. Resilience, my friends, is a learned behavior. And yes, some people are born with it, but most people learn it. It's defined in the dictionary as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties or being tough. It's also defined as the ability of a substance or an object to spring back into shape and have elasticity. You know, sometimes I think as humans, we should learn to be a little bit more object-like in this way, a little bit more willing to be elastic and spring back into shape. So I ask you this, my brave listener, how resilient are you? How quickly do you recover when things go wrong? Do you have the ability to spring back into shape? Well, this week's episode is all about learning to be resilient, and it's a story of hope. Author, coach, and Arctic expedition guide and expert, uh, let's just pause for a minute to talk about how cool that is. Heather Torkelson joins us to talk about growing up wealthy, but severely neglected. Neglect is not just for the underprivileged, and it's often overlooked because we just assume the wealthy are happy and well cared for. This is the story of learned resilience and finding the strength that we need from within. As Heather puts it, most of our limitations are about how big we choose to dream. Speaking of dreams, have you ever dreamt about starting a podcast? If so, if you've even had an inkling of a thought, like, I would really like to have a podcast one day, or maybe you've been thinking about it and dreaming it and planning it in your head for ages. If you've ever thought about starting a podcast, then I invite you to join me and the experts from the Podcast Power Academy for a free live session today, which is Thursday, July 16th at 2 p.m. Central. We are going to talk about all of the reasons this is a great time to start a podcast and exactly what you need to do to get started. It is a fun, live, engaging session. No slides. We're not showing you a PowerPoint presentation. We're just talking and answering all of your questions. All you have to do to join us is register, and you can do that at podcastpoweracademy.com. Once you register, we send you the link. And if you miss us or you're not able to make it today, Be sure to subscribe anyway so that we can let you know when the next live session is happening. I am really excited to see you there. I hope that you will be resilient enough to come and chat with us about the possibility of starting your very own podcast. So my friends, my brave listeners, now I invite you to get something that you like to drink and get cozy and stay tuned to learn all about the power of resilience. Resilience, self-belief, and tenacity. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Hey, everybody. This is Heather Vickery. Welcome to this week's episode of the Brave Files podcast. You're going to be really, really glad you joined us today because it's the battle of the Heathers. It's awesome. It's not really a battle. We're collaborating. Uh, Today's guest basically raised herself while living in Costa Rica with her father, who was an airline pilot, and she didn't speak Spanish. Heather Torkelson says she had no choice except to choose herself again and again and again. And that's how she created the life she wanted and grew past the difficulties of her childhood. She also reminds us that neglect sees no socioeconomic status and that being neglected as a child or a young person is extremely difficult to deal with, but that resilience is in fact a superpower. Heather, welcome to The Brave Files. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I've been really looking forward to this. I was just telling you before we started recording that resilience is a word that I love and has just been presenting itself to me over and over and over again. Tell me a little bit about what resilience means to you. 
Well, resilience is the reason why I'm why I'm still here, to be honest. I think resilience is the is, is one of the themes of my life. And I, I think probably a lot of people can relate to that just because I believe that life is not so easy. You know, I talk about this with a lot of people. Like it's not yeah. easy. Adulting is hard. Relationships are hard. The, things in general are just not sort of a white picket fence. Everything's hunky dory, you know. And so True I'm story. quite <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm quite glad in retrospect, as you said, I had to raise myself, and that was extremely difficult. But it made me be able to face adulthood and all the slings and arrows of life with a greater degree of resiliency because I had no choice when I was younger, right? Like I, that muscle got built whether I wanted it to or not. Yeah. And now I'm able to bounce back from failures or disappointments or challenges or whatever so much faster than the average person. And I know that because of the people I'm surrounded with, you know, like my friends yeah. and family, I notice that I'm the one who's like, right, okay, we're back in action. Let's keep going yeah. faster than everyone else. Do you think that is something you were born with or you learned it just because you had to? And then a follow-up question to that is, um, why do some people gain this skill of resilience during difficult childhoods or, or lived experiences and others don't? And I'm asking, you're not a scientist. We all know she's not a scientist. She's not a psychologist. <laughs> this is a non-scientific this is, response. This is just the lived experience. I'm, it's just a, a, a curious conversation. Yeah, I I don't really know whether or not I was born with some of this, to be honest, because I all I can tell you is that when I was a, a young child, before my parents split up and before I was taking care of myself, essentially, I was an absolute basket case. I was very anxious, oh, wow. very shy, um, huge introvert, still am, <laughs> like a very, very social introvert, you know? Um, and I, yeah, I was a complete I was a mess. I was a hot mess of a kid. And uh, I used to have stomach aches all the time. I used to burst out crying in school all the time. I mean, my home life wasn't good. So obviously there were presentations of anxiety at a young age, but I wasn't a resilient kid, you know? Um, And then like life circumstances changed and I had to, as you said in the intro, I had to choose myself. I had to choose every day to show up for myself because nobody was showing up for me. So I built that muscle and maybe deep down, there was a part of me that was just naturally resilient and I didn't know it. And I tapped into that. I'm not sure. But, you know, here we are now. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. The, the second question, remind me what your second question was. Just what do you think could be the difference? And this is just theorizing, folks. In folks who learn the resilience like you did and those who just don't, even though, the you know, they just keep keep getting right. knocked down and they don't keep getting up, which I will say as a caveat, I think way more people do. Yeah. Way more people are much, much stronger than they think they are. Yeah. But sometimes, and or maybe you just feel that way. If you're listening, you just feel like you keep getting knocked down and man, it hurts and it's hard and why can't you catch a break? Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think there's, I, I'm going to give you a really top level observation around this. And that is that some people choose to be victors and other ones are okay staying as a victim. And I don't mean okay, like they're like, I don't mind, but... They don't know how. uh, They don't know how. So the the default mode, the way that they cope is by staying in victim mode because there is a payoff to being in victim mode. You know, people... Sure there there, is. There's there's always a payoff. Every single behavior that we have, there's a a reason for it. We're getting some kind of positive feedback loop. Um, So, but at at whatever point in my teen years, when I was in the middle of this sort of becoming who I I have become, I was like, I'm not down with this, you know? Like, I'm not going to let this get me down. I am not going to let this get me down. I am going to do something with my life. I, I just felt this, like deep-seated fire in me that the that. choices that other people had made, my terrible choices from my parents, were not going to ruin everything for me. Yeah. And that's why I came out on the other side, not as a victim. And I was like, nope, I decide. This is my life. Self-determination, 100%. Good for you. We have theirs, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're, how old were you when your parents divorced? I was 10. And in a very unusual. This was in the early 80s, right? I won't give your age away, but do I have that right? Uh, late 80s, actually. Late 80s. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, you're younger than me. It was very unusual then for fathers to get full custody of their kids. 
Yeah, especially when there are three little girls who had been raised full time by their stay at home mother. So, oh wow, I didn't even realize you had siblings in, in involved in this. I guess it's yeah. maybe better than being completely alone. Where did you fall in the lineup? I'm the middle one. You're the middle one. All right. Mm. So I don't want to dwell on this too much, but I'm curious, how did you all end up with your dad? It's a very good question. <laughs> I think because in 1989, people were a bit stupid about stuff like this in terms of like the legal system and the small town that we were living in. The long and the short of it is that my dad is a very, very clever sociopath. And he's a charming, charismatic airline pilot who can pull the wool over most people's eyes. And we were absolutely terrified of him absolutely terrified of him. So it was easy for him to say, right, girls, you're going to all come and live with me now. And we were like, okay, you know, and then my mom just didn't have the skills to be able or the money to be able to stand up to him. And so she lost her three little girls and we didn't see her for 10 years. Oh my gosh, that breaks my heart. I literally, my I literally felt my heart like fall apart when you said that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a crazy story. Like I I've actually thought about going back to the lawyers, emailing them now 30 years later and saying, so guys, what the hell? (laughs) You know, like who was advocating for us because three girls going to live with a father who was only physically present in the country 50% of the time. You know, we were 7, 10 and 14. And then after that, um, we he separated us from not just our mom, but all of our extended family and friends. And then he eventually separated us from each other. So by the time I was living in Costa Rica, my little sister was there for a short period of time, but she completely went off the rails and got sent away to boarding school. So then I was alone. Oh, my gosh. That's yeah. horrifying. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that that could happen. Um, and you were, did you have contact with your mom at all? No, nothing. There was no internet, you know, like there was no of course way. Not. Yeah. I wasn't even allowed to, when we first moved to Costa Rica, I was 14. There was like long distance calls cost a lot of money. I wasn't allowed to even call my old friends back home. I, I was completely isolated and I had no lifelines or anything. And then my dad would leave and go do his piloting, you know, and I would just be taking care of myself in a foreign country, getting to school and back, you know? That's crazy. Yeah. Do you have a relationship with your mother now? I do. Yeah. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. I cannot imagine. I'd like to interview your mom. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm really serious. I cannot imagine what that feels like and how you survive those 10 years. Yeah having someone steal your children from you. Yeah, it's pretty hideous. Oh my gosh, sorry. We're not here to talk about your mom, but that's um, understandably not something we find when we look you up on the internet, Heather. No, it's not. I mean, I am I am very open about this story yeah. because I, I think that there are probably so many more people out there who, not to the same weird degree that I was, but people who have been isolated from loved ones yeah. and stuff. And, you know, a lot of us go through this kind of stuff. And I think the more we talk about it, the more it feels like something we can talk about and we should talk about. I really honor that. I really appreciate that. So how did you, at the age of, what, 13? How old were you? Uh, 14 when we moved to Costa Rica. Okay. How did you, at the age of 14, craft a successful life for yourself? And by successful, I mean, make sure you were cared for, make sure you did get to school when you were alone the majority of the time. Yeah, I... I mean, I will admit, I am from an upper middle class Canadian family. I was put in a in a private school there because I had to go to school in English since I didn't speak Spanish. So I was in a private school. So that that was great. I mean, I am I'm not going to pretend like I'm just this amazing fighter. Like I come from privilege, you know, (laughs) Okay. however, however, um, and that's why, you know, in the intro, you mentioned like socio uh, neglect sees no socioeconomic status. And I think that that's a really critical piece. When people think of neglected children, I think they think of children of like poor people or alcoholics or like some other, like these people that are like the lower end of society, let's say. And I could not disagree more. You know, there is so much neglect, even at middle class and upper middle class and in the super wealthy, there's so much neglect. And there's emotional neglect, there's physical neglect, there's uh, the varying degrees of it, you know, and I had both those emotional, physical, relational, you know, I was very isolated. And I think that I had been in, when we were still in Canada from 10 to 14, that, that phase where my mom was already gone. Right. My siblings and I were all still under one roof at that point, but we were all sort of in survival mode. We weren't able to be helpful to each other because we were kids, 
you know? So it started a little bit earlier. And then by the time I moved to Costa Rica, I was just like, good grief. Like I, I, I just have to get up every day and make sure that I get things done. Because the other thing is my dad's attitude was if you keep quote unquote behaving yourself and getting good grades, I'm not going to mess with you. But if you stop behaving yourself and your grades slip, you're in deep, you know what? And I had seen him get very abusive with my siblings. Yeah, I was going to say, what does that mean? Like, you're not going to be okay. Are you physically in danger? Potentially physically in danger, but also in danger of him throwing me out with nothing. And at that point, I had been estranged from my mom and all of my aunts and uncles and everyone for four years. And I thought, I will have nothing. Like, where would I go? You know, and because that's what a that's what a sociopath makes you believe, you know? Absolutely. And so I was just like, I just gotta, I just gotta kick butt. I gotta be amazing. I gotta do great in school. I've got to, I mean, I was always quite good in school. So I just had to focus on that and I have to take care of myself and I have to, and I was, my sisters were much more like boisterous, let's say. And I was the classic middle kid, middle fly child. under the radar, oh, like yeah. <laughs> appease, 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 uh-huh. you know, like no matter how much I want to take this dinner fork and like stab it into my dad's neck right now, I'm going to make him feel like the greatest human on the face of the earth. Because as long as he thinks that I'm the best kid in the world, I can survive this and I'm going to eventually get out. Wow. What an extraordinary, and I, I use that word in a positive and in a negative way, uh, to have to behave as a child, to learn to behave. Yeah. I suspect, though, that that has served you well, as effed up as that is, uh, yeah. as a professional adult. Yeah, yeah, it has in so many ways, in so many ways. Like learning to be able to deal with people like that, extremely difficult people, learning how to basically be a chameleon in different scenarios, knowing that no matter how bad things get, I will still be alive and I will still find food to eat and a place to sleep and all that kind of stuff. Like I, yeah. I've proven that to myself over and over again, both under the, let's call it reign of my father, but then also subsequently later in life when I kind of threw myself into some scenarios that were really terrifying for me just to prove that no matter what happened, I could, I could pick myself up and keep going. So you knew you were putting yourself into dangerous situations? Not so much danger as very foreign and terrifying for me, who okay. still was very okay. anxious. Like right. I was I was extremely anxious until about 30 years old. That's fascinating. So what I'm hearing you say is that you chose bravely. Like you you thought these things are scary, but I'm gonna try them anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I, like I felt to- like I had to. Like I, I needed it, I needed to do it to prove to myself that I could be who I wanted to be. Can you give us an example? Yeah, I so I started uh, university a year younger than everyone else when I came back to Canada, and then I hated it. I went into a really deep depression. I had really bad culture shock when I came back to my own country. I imagine. And then, and also, I quite frankly had felt like I came back from a war zone, and so everyone seemed very carefree. All of the other people my age seemed very carefree and like whatever. And I was like, you don't understand how hard life is. <laughs> You know, so so I I was very weird. I was a total weirdo, black sheep, like I didn't fit in. And so I lasted two years at that university and then I decided to leave. And I thought, okay, I'm I'm a mess. I'm depressed. I don't have any friends. I don't know how to fit into my own country anymore. I don't even really know who I am. Like I've been so screwed up by these teenage years and what's what's happened that I needed to go and like I need to test my own limits a little bit and figure out who I am and what I want in this life. And so I moved to Japan when I was 19 with no job, no house lined up, nothing. And I just had, I think, about $3,000 that I had saved in this really crappy job that I did over the summer, stocking shelves at 5 o'clock in the morning in a pharmacy and a backpack. And I went to Tokyo, and I still remember, I have a blog post about this somewhere, I still remember standing on a street corner in Tokyo thinking, I'm I'm going to throw up and then I'm going to lay down on the street and just die. <laughs> <laughs> like, what have I done? You know, this introvert in the busiest city at that point in my life, I was like, this is the most busy hive of a city I can imagine. I understood a little bit of Japanese because I had studied it in university out of curiosity. And I was just like, what am I going to do? Where am I going to live? How am I going to work? And then I just figured it out, you know? Like That's I, right. I just go, figure it out. I got over, I like every minute of every day that I was there in the first few months, I was spent getting over myself and like being terrified and doing it anyways. And that completely changed the game for me. 
I love that so much. I mean, it's for sure sink or swim, but I, I think for most people who would knowingly put themselves in that position, you're going to swim. Yeah. Yeah, you are. And like, that's a wonderful thing, right? I look, I I think deep down, I was like, I'm going to be fine, but I need to do this anyways. And I need to completely shake up the game. I need to ditch everything else behind because uh, I I just didn't even feel like I was living my own life up until that point. You know, I felt like I was playing a game or like doing a song and dance for other people. And so I had to kind of reinvent myself. And part of that was just terrifying the bejesus out of myself (laughs) and then so that I could come out on the other side I wanted to be like cool I can do this I can kick ass and take names I can go out into the world I can learn and be and uh, whatever you know and yeah it was it was quite a transformative time I love that I really do I think it's so fantastic and I will say you're right I love that you brought up earlier that you have an element of privilege um, Mm -hmm. and of course we absolutely agree that neglect does not discriminate against socioeconomic status. But your, your your privilege helped you be able to do that. But goodness, folks, if you're out there, you can create and manifest all kinds of things. I You can look for cheap flights. If you want to travel to a remote country and see what the hell happens, like those are yeah. decisions we get to make. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I love it. I think that is so cool. Heather, are you a parent? No, I'm not. Okay. Do you think that the way you grew up was part of your decision to not be a parent? Well, t- technically speaking, the jury is still out on parenthood. All right. Fair <laughs> I'm, enough. I'm, I'm at the end of my time when I should be taking it seriously. I'm 41 now. So my husband and I are like, okay, either we have a kid now or <laughs> we don't have a kid. Okay. Um, but I will say that it it's... It's definitely, I think, had a big, um, it's had a really big impact. And not in that I don't think that I'd be a good parent or anything like that. Of course not, yeah. Um, I just never, I've never been around kids very much. And I think they're, they feel very alien to me, partially because of the isolation that I had growing up. And so I don't, I didn't, for on the one hand, I don't feel that affinity of like, oh, children, babies, you know? Yeah. And on, on the other hand, I'm like, you know what? I spent so many bloody years of my life with all of the weight of my existence on my shoulders. I don't want to take on the weight of existence of another human right That's now. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. That's the, the pressure of it. The, yeah. I, you know, I, I have four kids. I love being a parent. I always knew I wanted to be a parent, mm-hmm. but I really don't think everybody's built to be a parent. Yeah. If, if fewer people didn't have children that didn't actually want them, yeah. we might have a very different society. So I absolutely honor, you know, we, we all have the right to decide that for ourselves and what's going to work for us. I had somebody who worked for me once years ago tell me that she, she said, well, that is why we're here, isn't it? To, you know, continue the species. And I was like, oh, <laughs> nope. <laughs> I don't think that. Yeah. <laughs> I actually don't think that. Nope. <laughs> no. So, we've, we've, we've got plenty of humans. That's not going to be an issue. <laughs> yeah. I was like, uh, no. So I, yeah. Th- thank you for sharing that. Because I do wonder if those things that are so huge in our lives as we grow up then continue to alter the choices we make mm-hmm. um, as adults. So. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Now, how has your lived experience led you to what you do professionally? Well, so I left the corporate world in 2010, and I knew without a shadow of a doubt at that point that I never wanted to work for anyone else again. (laughs) I figured that out right out of college. (laughs) (laughs) You're very lucky. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I mean, I, I, I don't think I... I, I can tell I can tell you for certain that I never really wanted to work for other people, except that I felt like uh, the financial independence piece for me after breaking free from my dad when I was 21 was really critical. I needed to be financially independent. I went back to university after I came back from Asia and I put myself through school and I went into quite a bit of debt because of that. I completely cut my dad off at that point because he was abusive and there was no point. Um, and so then I had no money. I had no funds and I was in touch with my mom, but my mom, my mom and I have a relationship, but she's like, a, it's a distant relationship, you know, like I, I have been completely, let's say, financially independent since definitely since 21 and more or less since I was about 17. So I, I felt the responsibility of getting myself into a good financial place so that I could be completely independent and debt-free, which is why I went and 
took jobs in my 20s. And then when I was 32 in 2010, that's when I left corporate finally because I was in a great place financially. And I was like, that's it. I'm done. I've, I've done exactly what I wanted to. I own a fantastic house, which is a good investment, which I've since sold and bought a new nice. house in Sweden, which is like amazing. So I'm really happy about that. And yeah, I, I knew when I went out on my own, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea how I was literally going to bring in the dollars. But I was like, I got to do something that actually feels motivating for me when I wake up in the morning. I've got to do something that feels yeah. worthwhile, you know? So I started off because I had no clue. I was like, well, why don't I get certified as a life coach? Because I don't want to be a life coach, but I think that the life coaching <laughs> skills will be a good, it's a good skill set to have no matter what you do when you're working with human beings, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I started with the life coach, life coach certification, started life coaching just to bring in some money so I wasn't sitting around on the dole. And then I started realizing that a lot of people from my life coaching certification program were like, what on earth? How are you getting so many clients? And then also during that time, I moved to Peru from Canada and people were like, how are you finding <laughs> clients in Peru? Do you coach them in Spanish? And I was like, no, no, no. It's called the internet and Skype. <laughs> So that turned into helping people um, develop small businesses online. And then that developed and that developed. And I started doing international retreats with, you know, early stage entrepreneurs. And then eventually by about 2015, I started working with sort of more established entrepreneurs who were looking to up level their businesses. And I also opened my own second business, which is a polar expedition company. That's so cool. <laughs> it really is really fascinating to me how... You, so share with everybody what the name of your business is. So my primary business, which is under heatherthorkelson.com, is called No Plan B. And it's a, okay. it's a coaching and consulting company for incurable entrepreneurs like myself. People who can do job, they can work for other people because they're self-sufficient and they're motivated and they're detail-oriented and blah, 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 blah. But they cannot handle working in those structures. <laughs> you know, the nine to five is just not on. And so, I mean, even not nine to five, my last corporate job, I worked from home and I worked my own hours and I freaking hated it because the yeah. job was soulless and I didn't like my coworkers because yeah. I felt that they were not, like everyone was just trying to get away with minimum viable work. And that's just not my jam, you know? Right. So right. incurable entrepreneurs are, are the people that I, that I work with and that I attract these days. And then my other company, the Polar Expedition Company is called Twin Tracks Expeditions. Okay. Well, the reason I ask is I, I knew it was plan B and I love that. And to me, that resonates so much with your childhood and your growing up. Again, your your decision, which wasn't really a decision to choose yourself again and again and again, and to find a way to survive and thrive and be okay and to push yourself into terrifying areas like moving to Japan, all of that, there's no plan B. Yeah. You there's just no do plan it. B. Yeah. And you just so, suck it up and make it happen. <laughs> yeah. And I just, I love that so much. Um, there's no playing small for you. So I think that is really cool. And now I am absolutely curious, polar expeditions. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah, I know. It's weird. <laughs> is it, I mean, is it, is, I feel really stupid. Like you take people to the polar ice caps and explore. Is that what <laughs> Yeah, not quite, but okay. it's, it sounds like that. It sounds like okay. that. So, so polar expeditions, the common places that people go are to the Antarctic, of course, and to the mm -hmm. Arctic. But when you go to the Antarctic as a passenger, like as a traveler, you usually go on an expedition ship. Scientists go to the, to the polar ice cap. They go deep into Antarctica where it's like minus 40, but regular people don't go there. Can't do so, that, right. Yeah. yeah. So as someone like you, for example, you could book a trip on an expedition ship of 100 or 200 people, fly down to the southern tip of South America, sail across the Drake Passage for two days, and voila, you're in Antarctica. There's penguins everywhere. There's icebergs everywhere. There's whales. It's totally fantastic. And that is a massive industry and growing. There's about 50,000 people that go there per year right now and it's growing. So we book people on those trips and also, well, we used to, my husband who I met in 2013 as a polar expedition leader, I met him on a ah. ship going to Antarctica. Okay. <laughs> and then I was like, why are you trading dollars for hours? This is a really stupid uh, career idea. <laughs> So not stupid, but it's very exciting. But you, you get locked after a while, right? Sure. Like, what do you do yeah. if you're, in, you're literally your day rate is based on you being on a ship somewhere, right? Then when you're at home, you're not making any money. You have no benefits. You have no safety net. Yeah, absolutely. So 
So I was like, and he also has a twin brother. They're Swedes. They're big. They've got red beards. They look straight out of Vikings. And I'm like, you two dudes are a walking brand. We need to have our own company, you know? So in 2015, I said, let's open up Twin Tracks Expeditions and we start selling this stuff. And then by, and then the, the opposite of that in the Arctic is people go to see polar bears. Similar thing. They go on ships. It's usually to the Norwegian Arctic, which is one of the best places to see polar bears. And we, our long-term dream was to start hiring our own vessels and running our own trips because of both of the guys being expedition leaders, me being a certified polar guide as well now, and all of our friends being polar expedition staff. And that was sort of a thinking, we were thinking 2020, 2021, but we actually managed to start doing that in 2018. So we what? are now, yeah, we're now going into our third season running our own trips only in the Arctic, not Antarctic, but in the Arctic, we run our own trips on small vessels. So 12 passengers, we take people to go see polar bears and walruses and all kinds of cool stuff. I, I want to go. It's amazing. I, it. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I hate the cold. I can't tell you how much yeah. I hate the cold. So the fact that I'm sitting here saying, I got to do that. I got to do it. I'm going to put it on my vision board. I, he- Heather, let me tell you, I hate the cold more than most people. I moved to Peru from Canada because I was like, that's it. I'm done with winter. I'm going to a moderate <laughs> climate and I'm never going back. And then I ended up meeting this guy. And the next thing you know, I'm working on the ship so that I can be with him. I'm like taking a break from my business company, you know, my business consulting and like going away for two months at a time to be with him on ships and driving Zodiacs and stuff. I bloody hate the cold and I have really bad circulation in my fingers and toes. So I'm always freezing. And now I have a polar expedition company and I got to tell (laughs) you, it took me 35 years to learn it, but it's all about how you dress. (laughs) I love life. Well, that's, that's true. Um, (laughs) I what I love about you is like, okay, you, you seems like you just have no fucks to give. Quite frankly, excuse my language. Like you're like <laughs> I will do all the things that make me excited. <laughs> yeah, I think that's pre- a pretty accurate <laughs> representation I, I, of me. <laughs> we just all need more of that in our lives. Do more of the things that make you excited. Trust yourself enough. Yeah. To try it. Yeah. And just say yes to the stuff that you think is exciting and who cares what everyone else thinks. Oh, I love that. So how, as you've been doing, I mean, when I think about your childhood, there could be a million answers for this, but as you've grown from that, what's been the most, because it sounds like everything's kind of been easy, which I know it wasn't when you were growing up, but since then, so what's been the most difficult thing? And And I know that it probably hasn't all been easy, but to hear you talk about it, yeah. That's what we're hearing. It's, it's, it sounds, yeah, you're right. It sounds easy. It's so not easy, Heather. I can't even tell you, like, none of it's easy. It's all <laughs> really you. tough. People need to hear that, right? It's not easy. Doing, yeah. doing the things that make you excited are worth it, but they're not easy. No, it's not easy at all. But your tolerance level for things like uncertainty and risk really, really change the more you take risks and the more uncertainty you live with. And so, you know, it's never easy. It's, It's never easy. The most difficult thing for me, actually right up until about the time that I met my husband, the most difficult thing was truly the the aloneness of my own journey in the world. I had nobody. I had nobody to fall back on. I had no safety net. I had no home to go home to if I was tired or broke or having a mental breakdown. I had nothing. I didn't even have... Like I moved around so much over my life. I live in Sweden now. I'm from Canada. This is my seventh country outside of Canada. And I had no single person who has even come to visit me in the different places where I've lived around the world. So I have nobody who shares my story. You know, I have my younger sister who I am not, who I don't really have much communication with. I have my older sister who I've always been in some degree of communication with. But she's never been to most of the places that I've lived outside of Canada. So nobody knows my friends in those different places. Nobody knows the journeys that I've been on. Nobody knows the struggles that I've been through with entrepreneurship. It's only been me. Wow. And when you don't have anyone to talk to who shares that story, who carries your story with you and, and or can help be a soft place to land, it's, it's crushing. And it wasn't until I had my, until I met my husband where he literally said to me, like, I am your soft place to land. Aww. I'm your family now. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I have chills. I love that. Oh, he can make me cry so easily because it's true. Like, I, he, is the, he, he and his family, actually, who are very close and really wonderful, have just been an absolute, uh, an absolute blessing for me. It's allowed me to rest for the first time in my life. 
Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so I, my next question, and you may have just answered it, is what's been the greatest surprise, the most wonderful, pleasant surprise? Oh, um, what's been the most wonderful, pleasant surprise? I think that 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 idea that if you have a dream and you you put your mind to it, you can make it happen. I that's been a surprise because it's turning out to be true again and again yeah. and again. You know, I, love um, it. I think the only thing that really limits me. And again, I'm coming from a place of privilege. I'm a white lady. I'm <laughs> able-bodied. You know, Thank you I, for that. I live yeah. in a country where we have socialized everything, and like even university is free. But still. Uh, I I realize now that, you know, the most of the limitations in my life are just in me, in myself, between my own two ears and um, in how big I choose to dream. So, yeah. you know, comfort is a very sexy thing. You want to stay comfortable all the time, right? And right now I'm a little bit craving too comfort, but yeah. not too comfortable, but I'm craving just like not taking too much risk because the last few years have been mega risk taking with the sure. Polar Company. But, it, you know... I'm, I know myself within the next 18 months, I'm going to be ready to start going really big again. And, you know, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I love it. Does this feel brave to you? Does your life feel brave to you? It does. And only because I don't really know that many people that live a life like mine. Uh, I don't know any, I, I've, we've interviewed people who take their business on the road and travel the world. So that part is there, but all of the elements that you're doing with the, the background that you have, I think it's pretty damn brave. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> but I, I think it's all brave. I really do. I mean, that's the mission of the show is there are a thousand ways to embrace bravery every single day. And my favorite little nugget from this entire conversation is the idea that you can do the things that make you excited. You can do them. And that is incredibly brave for most people. Yeah. Absolutely. And I don't want to discount the small acts of bravery that people experience every single day. And like, I'm not kidding when I say that I'm an introvert. I'm very, very socially capable. If you see me at a conference, I'll be chatting everyone's ear off. But most of the time I like to be alone. I live in the middle of nowhere in Sweden, like in a tiny little country village. And I love it. And if I don't see anyone for days, I'm super happy. Yeah. So like, well, and, the, and also you were used to it. That's yeah. how you always lived your life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like I've been so isolated that it almost became the norm, you know? So <laughs> like to... for, for me to, to go to the post office and speak to someone in Swedish about picking up a postal package, that takes a lot of guts for me. So like, it's a weird thing, right? And I think people listening, especially people who are more introverted or who are more, you know, just maybe socially anxious and stuff like that will understand exactly that. Like you can go out there and have like run a polar expedition company and like write books and like, I speak at conferences sometimes, you know, do all these things. But at the end of the day, I'm kind of like crapping my pants a little bit when I'm going down to the post office <laughs> to talk to the lady in Swedish, you know, like Thank that to me requires that. a lot of bravery, you know. Thank you for sharing that. I this, That's <laughs> so fabulous for everybody who's listening. Like you can be a powerhouse, a badass that does incredible things. And then the most seemingly <laughs> basic nuanced thing can be terrifying for you. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah, it's totally, it's not only is it okay, it's normal. Yeah. It's normal. We are yeah. weird. People are funny <laughs> creatures. And like, whatever it is that you're dealing with, it's fine. And you know what? Give yourself some credit. Like, that's brave. If you do one small act of bravery every day, you're a brave person. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love it. This has been such a fun conversation. You mentioned writing a book and you have a new book out. Is that right? Yes, it's called No Plan B, and it is specifically for, as I mentioned earlier, incurable entrepreneurs. It's not a how to build a business book. It is how to become the entrepreneur you need to be to make the change that you want in the world. That's awesome. Well, I cannot wait to get my own copy of it. What I'd like to quickly ask you is what's your writing style? How did you get this book written? Oh, well, I wrote, I wrote a first draft just with an accountability partner, which was really tough. I committed to 500 words a day and it took me four months. And then I hired a developmental editor who basically took my original draft, <laughs> transmorgified <laughs> it into like, you know, chapters. She's like, here's how you need to structure all this content so that it makes sense. And we're going to rewrite it. And we, re we rewrote it over another, uh, just under six months it took me to write the 
the second, second and final version. draft. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I love that you shared that. First of all, your writing habit is fi- all I'm committing to is 500 words a day, which is pretty manageable, but still to do anything every day until you're done oh my God. is a huge commitment. Um, yeah. And that those developmental editors are genius. They're life-changing. The right? best. Be- the because best. we need somebody outside. I-, I can't tell you how many times I send things out with typos. I feel like an idiot, but mm-hmm. I-, I know what it's supposed to say. I don't notice the mistake or it makes sense to me. So you need yep. somebody on the outside to, to to refocus that for you. Totally. And everyone who, I know so many people who are like, oh, I've been writing a book for about four years. And I'm like, yeah, it's not going to get written because you're doing it in a vacuum. We all need people, you know? That's right. The people who are writing like a book a year, like all these entrepreneurs who are just killing it out there, they either have ghostwriters or they have editors that are actually holding them to timelines. Oh, yeah. Nobody does it alone. Yeah. This year alone here in 2020, I have um, in the makings two ebooks, a full length book, and then a collaborative book. And there's no way I'm doing it on my own. People are like, you're crazy. And I'm like, no, 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 no. There's a system in place. So yeah, yeah. Um, I don't want to yeah, perpetuate a myth that everybody does things alone. Nobody does anything successfully completely alone, in my opinion. Yep. I yeah. agree. So you, you've you got this book out, which is so exciting. You've started you know, this new business, you've got the ship, which I think is incredible. We're going to link to all of that in the show notes. You flat out survived this neglectful, somewhat abusive mm-hmm. uh, childhood. So many things to celebrate. How do you like to celebrate? I like to go out into the woods. <laughs> all right. I really like to be out in the woods in nature. In Sweden, we have a season that's all like foraging. So from about July to November, you can get tons of wild blueberries, lingonberries, and different kinds of mushrooms in the forest. Now I and need to go to Sweden. Really, you do. If you like <laughs> if you like being outdoors, this place is like, the, the forests here have forest floors that are covered in all this like soft moss. Aww. And you, you walk into it and you think, oh my God, I'm in a fairy tale. Like, is this where the Vikings came from? What is going on here? And it's magic. And so... I like whenever I really accomplish something big or I just whatever, what I like to do is really just get away from my to do list. I want to get out of the house. I want to go to the forest, breathe the air, find some like chanterelles and be happy. I love it out there. I love it. That's a beautiful form of celebration. And you painted such a gorgeous picture of that. (laughs) Thank you for sharing it. And then my last question for you, Heather, which I just adore you. I want to be friends. Can we be real life friends? (laughs) Absolutely. Okay. (laughs) Sure. Great. Excellent. So I hate to even end the conversation. Now I feel like I have to travel the world just to go hang out with you in person. But <laughs> which I t- completely invited myself into everybody. So Heather, <laughs> I hope that was okay. It's all um, good. <laughs> what is your favorite charitable organization to support? I like to support Kiva. I've been supporting Kiva since probably 2005, right around the time that they started to grow. Um, and it's, the reason why I like to support Kiva is because it's um, empowering individual people with micro loans. I think that's, you yeah. know, for, for people who don't have any kind of generational wealth at all available to them, like self included, I'd love a micro loan, you know? And so I think, okay, yeah. I come from privilege. I can, I can help if I can help some, like a single mother somewhere in a developing country, get her business up and running, then that is money well spent. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you for sharing. They'll be our charity of the week. Folks, go see what you could do to support them for very little money or time or just, you know, telling other people about the organization. You can make a huge, huge impact. Heather, will you share your three words with us one last time? Yes, they are resilience, self-belief, and tenacity. Those are Excellent, powerful words, and I can see them in you. It's a beautiful picture. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be here across oceans to be in this conversation with me, and it was just really fantastic. Thank you so much, Heather. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Listeners, you know, resilience isn't something you're just born with. Heather just showed us that. While there may be a case for some people that they just automatically know how to be resilient, it's also a learnable skill. You're not stuck. Your past doesn't define you. Your weaknesses and your failures do not define you. You have everything you need to change your situation. You have everything you need to do the things that make you excited if that's what you desire. I hope you love The Brave Files as much as we love producing it. And if you do, I ask you to please go and check out our Patreon page. Find a level of support that works for you and become part of our Extraordinary Brave movement. You can find us at patreon.com slash bravefiles. And I want to know what you think of this show. How are you resilient? 
I really want to know, based on this week's conversation, what thing gets you excited that you're now going to try? Give us a call at 312-646-0205 and share all the goodies with us. Thank you for being here. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and always to go out and choose bravely. The Brave Files is proudly supported by Audible. If you enjoy listening to podcasts, you're sure to love listening to your favorite books on Audible. Get your free 30-day trial complete with a credit for a free audiobook download today simply by visiting audibletrial.com slash the Brave Files. Again, that's visiting audibletrial.com slash the Brave Files. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes, or get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we'd love to know what you think. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching, coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music is produced by Matt Lewis. Follow him on Instagram at mattmmusic or visit his website, theunionband.com. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to our associate producer, Kim Statler. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.